turns it on. Mm -hmm. I always get curious. It may not be on yet. Yeah.
Money on the next one. Okay. Do we have quorum? Full quorum. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you, everyone. We will uh, begin the meeting. Um, and first uh, is declaration of interests. None. Okay. Then um, I guess we just. All right, confirmation of minutes. Gary. Gary. <clears throat> okay. The first item on our agenda today is presentation on the GTEC awards that were recently announced. So I'd like to ask the Chief Information Officer, Mr. Duffett, to begin. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's uh, actually, uh, I'm really enjoying being able to talk about the, uh, the GTEC awards. Uh, GTEC is a government in technology and it recognizes excellence for leadership in technology and it's, uh, it's a very hard award to win. Uh, there's, uh, it's the Distinction Awards. It celebrates projects and individuals who demonstrate leadership and excellence in innovation and in management. And it goes through all of government, so it's municipal and federal as well. And there are th uh, hundreds of people that um, put in nominations for this, and it gets down to um, there were 73 nominations, and there was uh, 37 honorees. So just to make it to the honoree list is, is uh, pretty significant. The projects that we went up against uh, were, you know, everything from <clears throat> Uh, in water, uh, tracking submarines to uh, uh, military security to brand new accounting systems, those sorts of things. So it's no, um, it's no easy feat to, to win one of these awards. And uh, we were uh, very lucky or very, um, I shouldn't say luck because it was a great deal of skill that went to get three honorees in this list. Uh, I'm on the board of GTEC, so uh, uh, I got to see a lot of the submissions that were going through, and I, I also got to uh, put the uh, award around the neck of uh, Ottawa.ca uh, as they won. So out of all those submissions, we had three, three winners. We had uh, or, uh, uh, Public Works, uh, Management Solutions, the free public Wi-Fi was an honoree, and Ottawa.ca won. So two of them won out of the out of the three. So it was fantastic. Um, the I was also um, uh, asked to come and make the presentation for these groups, but I'd really like to, and, and I believe that we need to change the culture of how we do these things. I believe it's really a partnership between the business and IT. And the business put a lot of work into making these things happen. Of course, IT is, a, you know, is also a big component because of the work that goes behind it. So we're asking that the, uh, the people who actually, uh, the departments or the businesses who won the awards, to come up and tell a little bit about their projects. So the first one coming up will be uh, Neil Monkman of Public Works to speak on the Public Works Management Solution. Thank you very much, Charles. And Councillors, yes, the public works work management system has been, you know, four years in the making. We have started with our forestry branch. We then worked through our traffic safety mobility, and then th this award was revolving around the work we did with traffic operations. And it is truly being a transformational project, and because tra it's brought about transformational change in our department. We've looking and started back to sort of square one of how we do work within public works, and we've taken the philosophy that work is work. It doesn't matter what it is, whether it's you know, preventative, predictive, reactionary, um, but we want to track it, we want to monitor it, we want to make sure we're doing it efficiently. 
and in partnership not only with IT but with Service Ottawa, as, you know, they were a large part of this project from the start. We have done it in an integrated fashion, so we've linked it up to the lag in 311 system. So when the, the citizen calls about something, you know, a tree that's down, a branch that's down in a park, a traffic control signal that's out, they call 311, and then we let the computer systems do what they do best, and that's track it, look at it, so that call that's, you know, put into 311, automatically will create a work order or a notification for a public work staff. In many cases, it'll send it right to the individual in the field in the right area. They'll be able to do the work. We'll record the time, effort, cost of that piece of work. We'll close it, and then it'll automatically go back to the 311 system and close that call for the resident as well. 311 are able to track where we are with our work. We're able to look to see what calls we have. So it's been a very transformational project for us. One of the huge things is we've eliminated boxes upon boxes upon boxes of paper because we used to record all that stuff on a piece of paper that somebody in the field would write on at 3 in the morning in the snowstorm and then it would go to a clerk and they'd try to decipher the letters and the numbers and they'd put it in and then we'd put it through and then we'd try to pay somebody and then we'd do the, you know, the reporting after the fact. It's now all electronic. It's all within the computer systems that the guys have out in the field. It's what they wanted. And, you know, the elimination of paper is huge. And to Charles's point, it has truly been a partnership. We would have not had the success that we have had on this project without all of the IT staff that uh, are behind it. This particular project, the plaque that we received from GTEC has 77 names on it. And uh, so those were, and those were right from myself through to guys that are out in the field that we included that says, how is this going to work? And then we had them help them train their peers in making it work. So for that, it, it has been a success and it was an honor to represent the city and accept the award on Monday night. Yes, Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you for that. It's really nice to see that what we started a few years ago is actually working so well. Is, if, if we have any kind of information about how the impact of this has been on, on our staffing requires, the type of staff and all of that, to see how it's actually working into the efficiencies, which is what this is all part of, uh, that we're getting more work, we can get more work done with the same number of people, I know, but is there some jobs that then have become redundant and things? Has any analysis been done of that yet? To this point in time, the, there hasn't been that level of analysis, but there were efficiencies made because Public Works sort of, you know, we paid the piper early on in the process. There were, early, very early on in the Service Ottawa process, there were staff reductions within the department before, that took place before we actually implemented this project. So that's been one of the reasons we've been able to continue to f fulfill and do what we've been doing because it has been more efficient. But a formal study has not been done at this point in time. <coughs> I think sometimes we're backwards in our efficiencies. We say take so much money out for efficiencies and then we take, change the processes to make it work instead of doing the efficiencies and getting the benefits afterwards. So somewhere along the line we need to look at that. I'm really pleased with what you're doing. All right. Mr. Shenier. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, I'm speaking to the public Wi-Fi project uh, that uh, was undertaken to bring free public Wi-Fi to city facilities. Um, as many of you know, with the, the public increasingly have, have come to expect in, our, in the public areas of our recreation facilities, but also our admin buildings, uh, ability to access Wi-Fi for their laptops, tablets, phones, etc. Uh, and uh, we became acutely aware of this over the last few years as people are waiting in, in recreation facilities for their kids to finish swimming lessons or watching their kids play hockey. Uh, and had numerous demands that we simply could not meet using city resources given the number of facilities, the expense for connectivity, for, for hardware, um, all, of the, all of the costs that go into providing this service. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have some creative staff that took an innovative approach and went out to market to see what the private sector could do in terms of par partnering with us to do this. 
and to develop a model that uh, is, is able to uh, create revenue for the private sector through advertising and, and, and so doing is able to provide the services, Wi-Fi services uh, in our facilities, uh, demonstrated a very, um, a very good example of departments, various departments working together, whether it be IT, corporate communications, public works that assisted with the installation, my own department, procurement and working out a fair and, and competitive approach to, to going to market on this. And the result was, of course, that we were able to do 25 facilities in phase one uh, and provide Wi-Fi. It's been very well received. Uh, the folks that are in our facilities using uh, this, uh, this new service uh, have provided very positive comment. In, in fact, uh, uh, we're getting so many positive comments that there's, uh, there's a sense of urgency to get to phase two to do more facilities. Uh, and I've heard from counselors' offices, from members of the public, when are you going to get it in, in some of the facilities that don't have it? And of course, we'll be working with our private sector partner uh, to do that. Uh, but for now, the phase one uh, was, it, it is, is well on its way to being a, a, a very, uh, you know, very notable success uh, with uh, ongoing collaboration from the departments that worked on this to make it so. Uh, so uh, very proud of the staff that worked on this. Was, was that your hand up? Did you put your hand up? Okay. Okay. Councillor Drews. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, uh, I just have a question for Dan. I know the phase one, and uh, we're doing them in phases, but we do have community center that they don't even have a public, they don't even have a Wi-Fi for the user that they're using the facilities. So could you give me a little uh, time frame, or when will we be able to uh, deliver uh, Wi-Fi to our community centers that we really, they are uh, city facilities? Mr. Chair, um, phase one included two components. The first was the installation of the Wi-Fi equipment, and then the second phase is the installation of the, uh, of the screens for advertising and for the private sector proponent to go out and sell those advertising. So we're still completing that phase, even though we do have Wi-Fi in those 25 first, the proponent is still out there uh, essentially making this project pay for itself. Uh, we are starting to engage and look at the, the next wave will probably take the same approach as the first wave was, which is to prioritize facilities based on, uh, on the feasibility, but also the impact based on the number of users, the, the number of, of um, clients that, that traffic through the building and the types of buildings that tend to have people gathering, whether it be in lobby areas, spectator areas, those kinds of things. Um, so we're hopeful that, uh, you know, within the next few months, we'll be able to start engaging in discussions about where to go to, ne <clears throat> where to, go to next. Of course, um, financial viability for the private sector will be a, a component of that that will regulate how quickly they can move ahead with capitalizing a second phase of this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wilkinson. Yeah, just to step at one pace farther, there's some communities now that are providing with the cloud sort of internet service for the whole city. And um, so doing it in each facility has its own merits and things like that now, but we need somewhere, this is a high tech city, and maybe this is more for Charles that we need to take a look at how we're going to be able to do that. I think uh, New Brunswick, one of the cities, has done that already. Mm -hmm. And it's bringing a lot of business to them that would be not necessarily there without it. So just planning an idea. Someone was saying, why aren't we doing it? Uh, I get asked this kind of question all the time. And uh, we should be leading in these kind of things. So, And it would then mean that we wouldn't have to do it at every individual facility because we'd have it citywide. And the, uh, so in the next stage, maybe not to do each other more community centers, maybe the next stage is to go think big. Is, is that feasible, Charles? Um, <clears throat> Mr. Chair, yeah, anything technology-wise is absolutely feasible. I mean, I can, uh, I can do anything in terms of technology. It's 
um, you know, obviously the costs of that and how do we how do we do it and what problems are we trying to solve? I think, and that's where we're getting the business engaged and finding out. Uh, we're working right now with economic development, for example. So SAD is very big on uh, getting this city up to the latest technology. So I'm working with SAD now to figure out how we're going to do that. So then you can win another award with that. <laughs> or two or three. Okay, thank you. Vice Chair, please. First, uh, congratulations, obviously, on receiving uh, the GTEC Award uh, around the uh, free Wi-Fi project, and I'll have some additional comments uh, in a little bit about uh, the importance of the GTEC Awards. Um, I, I'm very impressed. The free Wi-Fi project, a uh, very innovative partnership with the private sector. Um, I'm really pleased to see the way the um, uh, staff have approached the private sector for a, an innovative model. There are two facilities in, in my ward uh, where we don't have Wi-Fi. Um, and the revenue uh, opportunity, the private sector case for putting Wi-Fi into, especially the Forward Avenue family shelter, um, is, is probably non-existent. Um, at the Forward Avenue shelter, we have you know, uh, dozens of children uh, who have devices uh, that they would normally be expected uh, under ordinary circumstances to be using to do their uh, schoolwork. Uh, they don't have Wi-Fi. They don't have internet access. They don't have um, the kinds of tools that children right across the city are using as a, as a part of studying these days. My concern um, with Wi-Fi, uh, as provided by the city, is that uh, we're only focused on those areas where there is a private revenue opportunity. What can we do uh, for those um, facilities where there isn't really going to be a revenue opportunity? It's possible that in subsequent phases, the Churchill Senior Center might be attractive to the private sector. Possibly. The Forward Avenue Family Shelter, um, almost certainly not. How can we get Wi-Fi into some of these places? Through the chair, um, but it, the department has looked at, prior to coming up with our private sector arrangement, we, we had worked with IT to look at um, the feasibility and then the cost of installing Wi-Fi. And so budgets is really um, the issue in this case, both the, the probably the relatively small but upfront capital investment in the equipment and then the ongoing um, fit maintenance fees, fees to support it, um, to move into facilities that wouldn't be uh, financed through through advertising or other other innovation, we would likely have to look at at, at an, another attempt through budgets at putting funds aside to to initiate that kind of a perhaps another pilot project at target locations that that would be. Uh, ideal for those kinds of things, things like shelters or, or, or other city facilities that don't necessarily have a revenue potential, um, but uh, but might um, well be served by that. Uh, but it really boils down to to, to a resourcing uh, issue, uh, as it has in the past. I'll, uh, I'll continue to pursue this with staff because um, it's uh, it's critical that we get internet um, into the uh, into the uh, the shelter. Um, it's it's frankly immoral that we are not currently offering that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Ms. Gray. Um, so I'm very excited today to actually present on behalf of the Ottawa.ca team. Um, as you're aware, the Ottawa.ca project was one of the projects in the Service Ottawa program that Council made a significant investment in the City of Ottawa in terms of infrastructure um, and innovation and technology. And both listening to Neil's work today, which was another project funded by the investment and direction of Council, and today's Ottawa.ca really demonstrates that both the ITSC uh, committee and the last Last term of council and this ITSC uh, committee are really reaping the benefits of, um, in the most prestigious awards, of the investments that council's actually made. And the Ottawa.ca, why I'm really excited is, as well, is excellence in public service delivery in the external world. And that's really been the whole shift that we've been supporting council in terms of becoming client centric and improving the service delivery to residents. And what's been innovative and what the committee actually recognized, I think, were a number of factors. One is 
in terms of the infrastructure, we changed the infrastructure, our traditional infrastructure, and thought differently about the technology solution we needed to enable the business to provide better access and service to residents. But that was only done by first engaging our staff and multiple city departments and our residents through the older adult strategy, through the youth, youth initiative, through client feedback, through discussions, absolute direct feedback and discussions with our residents about how do they want electronic channel. And our residents spoke to us and speak to us every day about the infrastructure that we put in that web so that we can continually evolve that to meet the changing needs of residents. It was about online service. Now we have online service requests so people do not have to come in person to our services. We have content that's dynamic and put in different ways, whether it be visualization, whether it be data, whether it be open data. Content that has meaning to residents based on data and analytics about what residents care about and what, what pages they, they access. The piece that I think that's also innovative is the amount of work and the commitment and excitement that got generated by our staff over the period of four years where they could start to think about how do we think differently about how we engage with our residents and pro provide information. We've gone from a website that really was a repository of departmental content to a dynamic website that has the ability to change, evolve, and continually adapt to that service and the needs of our residents. And that will change and evolve, and we see that, and you'll see that over this term of council as we come forward asking for direction of how we move forward with Ottawa.ca. But what I think is most important when we look at it is the combination of the technology, the innovation, but really looking first at what was our business problem. How do we get complicated, complex information out to our residents? And this is the first start of a digital channel, which we really hope to evolve. And this team, and you can see this team was um, kind of the architect, and Michelle Gregoire is in the audience today as one of the leaders in that team. <coughs> this team really took those ideas and innovation and collected all of those ideas and thought about which things would have the greatest value and impact on the website. So today I uh, recognize and congratulate this committee on the investments that they've made over the last term of council. Recognize that you're um, national, in the national competition, the City of Ottawa is leading, and we get calls every day to demonstrate how we're leading, and, uh, and I'm really proud to be able to, um, on behalf of the team, uh, accept the nomination or the award at, uh, at GTAC and share with my um, colleagues, who have also been very instrumental in driving this as a service delivery channel. So thank you for the opportunity to present on behalf of the team. Okay, Councillor Tierney. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, congratulations. I think uh, it's a big move ahead. I know we went through some iterations of websites in the day. Um, my question is, uh, did you also, did they touch on the My Service Ottawa aspect of things, or was this just primarily related to Ottawa.ca? <clears throat> Through the Chair. Really, the recognition of Ottawa.ca is about all the kind of innovation that we actually did. My Service Ottawa is a core component of the innovation of creating a customized portal for people to have transactions on the web, and that was a key compo component of the award and recognition, not only of the client-centric content, but of the transaction pieces that we put on the web. So absolutely, yes. Great, and thank you for that. And I think it's important... Um, uh, to, to recognize the features that are involved in there. It's a very, it's a, it's a great tool. What are we doing from a corporate communications point of view, and I might be going off the rails here on this one, to make sure people know about this product? Because it is handy. I mean, the amount of times I run into people and ask about their water bill, and I remind them, just go to my, my, uh, my Service Ottawa, and you can check it out for yourself. They don't even know it exists. So uh, I'm doing my part as a counselor, pushing it out in my messaging. Um, but are we doing anything from a, a corporate communications point of view? So from a, a, definitely the revenue uh, department has been very aggressive in their communication and marketing of My Service Ottawa in terms of bills that go out, any communication that that department um, puts out to residents around the functions in that. They've been very aggressive about communicating to that because obviously they have huge benefit from residents moving to that online channel. Um, in addition, what we've been doing is a number of ways we've been creating articles that people can actually use. And we're hoping now to take all 
all of the components, which part of um, today's presentation, all of those functionality of things that we've built and really creating some uh, communication and marketing campaign around how people can become um, or can move to digitally interacting with the city and all of the capabilities we've actually done to do that. Now that the program's complete, the Service Ottawa program, we have a pretty extensive um, inventory of different ways that people can uh, interact with us digitally, and now we really have to move the envelope to get people using those tools. Great. Thank you for that. Is that a question, Councillor Wilkinson? Okay, Councillor Reaper. Just a quick question on that. You mentioned that there was an inventory of, of ways in which people can interact with, uh, with the city digitally. Is that written down somewhere, the full list? Because I think that would be helpful to get out to, uh, to my residents. Uh, a few residents know how easy it is now to snap a picture of something on the street and email that picture directly to uh, 311. Extremely handy, and it's reduced the number of calls in my office. I'd love to get that full, um, uh, full list out to our residents. Yes, absolutely that exists, and we've done it in a way that is easily consumable for residents to understand what that means, and I'm happy to circulate that to you, Councilor. I'd love to see that. Thank you. All right, other questions? Oh. Okay, well, I want to thank you for a very informative uh, presentation, and uh, I'd like to uh, congratulate city staff and the private sector partners who worked on all of these projects. I think it needs to be highlighted that the GTAC conference, which took place uh, just the, this past week at Shaw Centre here in Ottawa, is a significant event gathering together considerable expertise in Canada's high-tech sector. It's an opportunity for the city to share ideas with public and private sector colleagues from across Canada and also to demonstrate Ottawa's considerable leadership and expertise in the, this area. These awards are a clear recognition of the innovation and excellence taking place in the City of Ottawa. Ottawa City Council, through our strategic initiatives, has identified modernization and digitization of service delivery as a key priority. The residents of Canada's most connected city expect their city to be there for them whenever and wherever they need us. These awards indicate that Ottawa has the expertise to realize that promise and that we are moving in the right direction. And now Councillor Leeper had something he wanted to say. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do know the GTEC Awards. Uh, I know the prestige uh, that is involved with those. I've been a panelist at GTEC a few times in uh, my previous life. Uh, my hearty congratulations to um, all the individuals who were uh, part of the teams that came up with these uh, innovations. Um, we are increasingly being recognized as an innovative city in which to live and work. A big part of that is the, the very large um, uh, technology private sector that we have. That, uh, that sector is a huge resource and it gives our city uh, a tremendous advantage in terms of improving people's quality of life, economic, cultural, recreational, etc. The um, uh, one of the projects offered, the free Wi-Fi project, involved a partnership between the private sector and uh, and the city. And it is important to note, uh, as uh, Mr. Shenley pointed out, that was uh, accomplished with minimal cost to taxpayers. I do want to continue to encourage staff to explore ways to work with the private sector, uh, whether it's through public-private partnerships or simply through knowledge sharing. Events like GTEC are a great way in which we can network. And I know uh, Mr. Duffett is um, uh, sending himself and, uh, and his, uh, his team on similar networking opportunities. Um, I think that the subcommittee has an important role to play in facilitating and guiding this process, and I encourage staff to keep us informed and involved. Congratulations to, uh, to all, of, uh, all of your team. Thank you. Councillor Wilkinson. I could echo that, but I'm not going to repeat it. But the, uh, I think one of the important things is, the things that I've been battling a little bit about is the fact that Hello Ottawa is a hub of high technology. The rest of Canada and the world don't really know it too well. And I think that this is an opportunity, I think, Charles, this is for you to work with our economic development team, which I know you're already doing to some extent, uh, to we need to get, maybe it's bragging rights, whatever it is, but the, the rest of Canada, when I talk to them, they don't know we have the largest high-tech park in Canada here. They don't know we have double the number of tech companies as they have in Waterloo. They think about Waterloo, and I keep seeing in the paper the Waterloo to Toronto 
corridor, and it used to be the Waterloo to Toronto to Ottawa corridor, and we have to somehow get back on that because it does impact on our ability to grow our industries here. And uh, so I think this, the, using these um, awards, which show, demonstrates that we're not only doing it in the, the companies, but also in the municipal fields and all, is a really important part of getting that word out. So it's, um, it's, an, it's gone going. When we started this committee in 2009, we were doing very little in technology. Our, our website was atrocious, if I can put it that way. You can never find anything on it. Um, we, were, we were doing everything manually. So over that period of about five or six years, it's remarkable how far we've come already. And I know that looking at the term of council priorities and things, that we're just flying ahead now. So I want to congratulate all of the staff that have been involved in, in all departments because this is not a one department thing. Uh, and, uh, and I'm so happy to hear that there's, your staff are excited. That's what makes high tech groups grow, their companies grow, they get excited. And with that, is, I think we're going to move mountains. So thank you. Well said. All right, thank you. Next item on the agenda is uh, Service Ottawa Update 2015 to 18 Strategic Initiatives. Good morning, Chair and members of the subcommittee. The report before you today provides an update on the six strategic initiatives associated with advancing Council's Service Excellence Strategic Objective as identified in its Term of Council Priorities adopted in July of this year. Collectively, these initiatives are focused on improving access to city services by increasing service delivery effectiveness while also realizing efficiencies. In transforming the organization's processes and technologies, the goal is to meet the increasing client demand for digital service delivery. Senior staff are present to provide updates on each of the six initiatives. Donna Gray, Director of Service Ottawa, will discuss the phone and counter implementation strategy, the open data implementation program, and the digital service strategy and implementation. Dan Chenye, General Manager of Parks, Recreation and Cultural Services, will discuss the program registration, facilities booking, and payment system replacement. Peggy Shank, Manager of Business Services Planning and Growth Management, will discuss the legacy technology system replacement. And finally, Charles Duffett, Chief Information Officer will speak to the IT Departmental Transformation. Thank you. So the first uh, the three that I'll speak to are the strategic initiatives that I've been tasked to lead on behalf of uh, Council for this term of Council. The first strategic initiative is the phone and counter implementation strategy. So as you're aware, through the Service Ottawa program, we implemented a number of tools and technologies that Neil spoke to earlier that would improve the effectiveness and efficiency of our online and our um, phone channel. Really what we're doing now is we're looking at where are there opportunities now from a business perspective to look at how do we deliver services on the phone and counter. What's important to understand is even though we talk about the phone and counter, we're really looking at all three channels. So when we look at look the phone uh, channel and we look at the counter channel, which we believe will always be channels that we need to have consistent in a municipal city that's serving multiple residents with multiple needs, we can't help though through that to also look at the web channel. Channel. So this analysis is also helping us look at when we are improving the phone encounter, where are there opportunities to further advance our online channel? So I think it's important for people to understand that. And we also want to leverage the investments. It's kind of um, what the Council said earlier about we've made investments. We took efficiencies based on an allocation of what we knew we would achieve or believed that we would achieve from that period of time. Now we have the ability to go into targeted areas and look at how can we leverage further uh, savings and further opportunities for enhancement in the quality of service on our phone and in-person channel. So we are looking at a number of things. We're looking at our operating model. How do we use, ch how do we use the phone across the city? How do we use the in-person channel? And we're looking at volume and metrics and transactions and trends and time. And we're looking at our technologies and the capability of our technologies and a vision to move forward. We're looking at what that will cost us in real estate and understanding our real estate and our IT capability that we need to um, leverage but also then advance. Our staff how much staff we dedicate to the phone and the in-person channel, and then looking at what's feasible to implement and execute to get 
the service delivery enhancements, which we believe are critical on these channels, under Council's strategic priority of service excellence, while also ba uh, balancing and really looking at what's the financial opportunities that this channel can actually provide. That's being done in combination of two, um, in two ways. We have an internal team that's focusing on that with the knowledge, experience, um, and understanding of the business, and we've been working with businesses, and then we will be looking at a peer review of that business case in terms of other, other things that we are not looking at or considering the, um, in terms of the move forward. So that's really where the phone and counter um, is in terms of that strategic initiative. Open data implementation is the second strategic initiative I've been tasked to lead on behalf of Council. And really the open data program was initiated um, under, the, uh, under the ITS uh, steering committee, or sorry, um, committee of Council, to really look at how do we move data and information out to public and residents. And we've done a fair bit of, of work in terms of moving that envelope forward. In terms of progress to date, what we've done um, this year is we've really been looking at um, the open data catalog and migrating that onto a platform in a newer, uh, newer version, an open source version. And what that allows us to do is it allows us to integrate with our open source web content, which is Drupal. And we've in increased and uh, have better integration between the city's website and our open data. So you can see now on our website where we have open data sets, we're integrating links to those open data. So as people go through content, they can look and find that data. The recent one that we put out, uh, which we identified in the park, was the quality in Ottawa Lakes. So we've put the data sets, which has 20 years of data, embedded in the content. So if people want to look at that from an analytic, they can go to the open data sets. So really trying to integrate data into the user experience on the web. We put over a dozen new uh, data sets this year um, out into open data, surface water quality, community gardens, private home daycare, licensed daycare, long-term care, employment services, community and social services, um, address points, roads, proposed roads, and we continue to do that. We will present back um, a plan around how we do that. We've also increased the feedback process for people um, to be able to, when they provide feedback to us, is a recognition and an email and a tracking number in terms of feedback that they're giving us on data sets. Again, to increase that two-way communication with our residents. In terms of where we're gonna focus on this term of council, we really wanna look now at community groups and, and our residents and our community to really understand how do we evolve that data program so that data becomes usable in the community. We want to really focus on showcasing the apps and the data sets that we have available, being able to really put those out to the community in a way that people can understand the value that that will bring to residents. We're moving now to a newly an open data license, which allows us to have the same standards as um, government services in terms of how we um, create those, those open data, which allows us to use multiple levels of government and common standards in the industry. And we'll be looking at, in addition to um, the public restroom facilities, which was a really interesting um, open data request that will have a direct service delivery benefit, we're looking at trying to get those unique sets of data, very much like the, the public restroom, that will actually translate into um, service delivery changes for, for the organization and for our residents. And we'll be coming forward to committee with a plan around the ones that we believe may have the greatest impact, and we'll be looking to this committee for direction. The last uh, strategic initiative is the digital service strategy and implementation. And this I'm really excited to talk about because this really brings all the lessons learned and the value that we've had in the Service Ottawa program, bringing it to the next evolution in our organization. And really what we're looking at again is focusing our digital strategy on what are the business problems that the city has in terms of the delivery of service and what are the issues that our residents have when trying to access city services or deal with our city services. So this is going to be focused very much on what is our residents experience with city services and we've been mapping some of those journeys which has been very interesting about how somebody starts and how they end in the city in those high impact high service delivery areas. We're going to look at where are their pain points we're going to look at how do we use data that they provide to us and that we provide to them. How do we integrate that into um, that service delivery process? And we're going to use our staff in a very engaged way 
to be able to come up with innovative solutions that will actually address the problems that our residents seek. So it's really taking that service delivery, getting the innovation in our staff, creating those innovation opportunities, partnering with innovation and community and best practices of what other municipalities across the world are doing, taking those best practices learning, targeting to those areas where we know we have business problems and business issues in the city, matching that to our environmental um, factors that are going to impact us, environmental, transfer, uh, transportation, uh, um, what is the context of our municipality, and really building a concrete plan with executable things we can do right now, because we don't want it to be a strategy that's waiting for four years for a great big investment. We're going to look for what are the things we can leverage and execute now, how can we move that bar each year over the term at council while still positioning us for a long-term strategy in support of our IT direction to move us to the next iteration of really being a digital smart city. So really when we think about the digital strategy, I've talked about the approach, I've talked about what it means. Right now we're in the early stages of just doing the research. This particular initiative, the funding starts in 2016, but we're well on our way of creating what we've learned, where we have capacity, what are the analytics and business problems, what's happening in best practices in the industry, and we're hoping very quickly in the new year to be able to start to have a dialogue with this committee about where the focus that we want to focus that digital strategy in this term of council and in the future. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, yes, yes. So it's Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you very much for that, uh, Donna. First of all, there are committee members. I might mention that uh, for your point of view, I spent an hour at, with a, somebody in the 311 center following how they handle the whole information coming in and all, and it's very impressive how it works now with the computers to quickly get information and send people on. I would recommend strongly that you do that. And next week, I have somebody from the 311 coming to my ward, my town hall meeting to have some of the people in the community made more aware. Because I think one of the things that we have, we have, we're getting a very fantastic system now. But the point was made earlier, how do we make people know about it? So these are some ways. But if you go, as I did, and sit there for an hour with a good operator, and we had to do a little bit of, he, each time he had to check with the person who called in for privacy thing, but nobody said that I couldn't listen in, which is great. And you hear what people are calling about in the themes and how they deal with it. Uh, so I want to thank you for moving this far forward. And it's really quite exciting, the fact that you and Charles are working so closely together because public information has become high tea in, as of now, and you really have to do that. I think there's, we're going to be getting more awards, so, uh, so keep it up. But do, do educate yourself. It's fascinating to see there. And I haven't been in the 311 section for about five or six years. When I went this time, the difference and change was remarkable. All right, thanks, uh, Councillor Tierney. Great. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there's several sections in here, so I think I'll just kind of go through a couple that I noticed that I had questions on. Uh, under the uh, SI48, Program Registration Facility Booking Payment System. Are we on this section? Good. Um, oh, are we going section by section? Which one are we on? Yeah, we're going section by so just hold off on that one. It's going to talk about the one behind me on the screen. All right. All right. So we'll we'll hold hold this question until. Okay, we'll do that. Wait, have we done 53? No. no. 49.51 and we just finished 52. So just hold that. Okay. You're doing a good job, thank you. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Mr. Chair, um, I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, Strategic Initiative 48, which is the replacement of our booking registration system. Um, most of you will know that we 
uh, our current system class uh, is what is used to process uh, a whole variety of business transactions that the department undertakes, uh, most notably admissions into our, uh, into our programs, registrations into our programs, and of course the scheduling and booking of our facilities. Uh, the class system uh, is relatively quiet for about 360 days of the year. You don't hear too much about it. It does its work in the background fairly efficiently. Um, and then on about four days of the year, um, we get uh, peak registration times where uh, folks line up to, to get into our programs, to register into our programs, and where you might get uh, peaks that the system um, is uh, the, simply overwhelmed by. Uh, so we have two major registration periods for spring and summer in March and then our um, August registration for fall and winter. Uh, at those on the nights where we open registration for, for these, these programs, um, we, we hit peak capacity where often uh, the, the feedback that we will get is that folks are having to wait uh, sometimes an hour, sometimes 90 minutes to refresh, refreshing their, uh, their web browser trying to get into the system. Uh, on most nights, uh, especially on our first night, which is our aquatic registration, that period of peak capacity um, can last up to two hours. Uh, and in land, it's usually just uh, the land registration, which is usually two nights later. It's usually just a little bit less than that. Um, there are, and then once we go by those peak registrations and it's ongoing registration until programs begin, there generally is not a, um, a peak issue. People are generally able to access the, uh, the system relatively easily. Um, there are indications if, if you look at the uh, first hour of registration on aquatic nights, in the first hour we do about 5,000 registrations, uh, which gives us an idea of the volume of, of people looking to get in as we open up registration. Um, it's, 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 and really what these folks are doing is trying to get the best times that are convenient to them so that prize Saturday morning at 10 a.m. or Tuesday evening at 7 type thing. Generally once the peak has, um, has gone by, we have about 50% of our offerings still available. So it's not that the services are completely filling up. It really is a race to your favorite time. And of course, um, there is a limit on how much service we can offer in those peak times, and then people have to take their second choice, either in terms of time, location, day of the week, those variables. Uh, the method of re registration, so through, through the online process, we have four servers that have 450 concurrent licenses and 20 phone IVR lines that, that are really a minor, um, uh, our, our anecdotal evidence would be that folks that can't get in through the web application try the phone just on the odd chance that they might luck in there. So it, it's a good kind of plan B for folks who are uh, trying to get into it. Um, in the beginning, when we first started doing this amalgamation, we would open both our, our online registration at midnight on the day that registration started. Um, but then of course people were saying, I have to stay up till two in the morning to, to be able to register. And gradually we moved that back to 10 p.m. the day before registration starts and then more recently to 9 p.m. which means that even if you are having to stay two hours on your computer trying to register, you're still getting to bed at a decent, uh, at a decent time and you're not waiting into, into uh, late into the night. Uh, this is a graphic representation of really how the business comes in, which is uh, that residents are usually browsing through either the PDF version of our guide or through Join Ottawa uh, app and coming in through a load balancer that then goes through the four servers. Uh, they eventually uh, make a connection, select their course, 
do the transaction, exit, and that frees up a, uh, frees up a line. And as I said, for the first little while, um, getting in is the issue. Uh, over the years, we have looked at operational, how can we change the business to to improve uh, the client experience. The fact that we do land and aquatics on different nights is a manifestation of that, that we have separated the two to separate the load of people trying to get in. By far, aquatics is still the biggest challenge. Aquatic in the west, west end of the city, remains the the the, the biggest pressure, simply because there are a lot of people chasing too few preferred times. We have looked at other, um, other ways of separating the business, geography, by season, by facility, and by age. Um, and having reviewed all of those, I've concluded that it would be, uh, we would be creating as many problems as we are solving by doing that, by, by trying to separate our registrations, we would end up with too many registration nights or the separation of facilities when parents are trying to register kids into facilities. Um, we, and, and so we have not gone there. We have maintained the land and aquatic separation um, as, as our model. Uh, technology considerations, uh, we have looked at the option of buying more, more architecture, essentially growing the server farm to, the, to, to try to deal with capacity. A conservative estimate is that another $2 million would probably bring the wait time down to 30 minutes perhaps uh, even better than that. Uh, but keeping in mind that really that would be $2 million to solve a problem uh, for about 90 minutes eight times a year. And so it, it's a very expensive and a value for my, a questionable value for money. We have looked at an interim solution to host online registration externally. Um, but through discussions about a year ago with our deputy city manager concluded that moving to a permanent solution would be uh, a better alternative and so we have not sought an interim solution. We are continuing uh, with, uh, with our existing solution for now. And then of course replacing the software, that is the long term solution uh, that we need to look at. Um, right now, the software that we're using uh, is being upgraded to the next version, to, so to class eight, and that will give us a, a bit more time to, to resolve this issue. The software will be, is being phased out by, by its, its manufacturer by November 2017, so we have, uh, we have to sunset this and find an alternate solution. Um, what we are looking for in terms of a new solution is something that will give uh, common registration, booking, and payment experience for the client. We'll be compliant with all applicable legislation. A real key one for, the, for us is the payment card industry requirements in terms of secure transactions. Um, a challenge that Ottawa faces that other municipalities not as much is, is to be able to do this completely bilingually. That is an expectation of our residents now. And uh, even though globally there are other alternatives, often the French version is not well developed, if developed at all. We need something that is scalable because we are still a growing city. Uh, we still have peak needs and other times when we don't need all of the capacity that the peak requires. Uh, and then, of course, because we're moving forward into a mobile-friendly social media world, uh, we want the new solution to be responsive to, to that new reality as well. Uh, we have initiated a project now to, to move this along based on council approving in July SI 48. Um, we are currently in the planning stage and will be until, uh, until the end of this, uh, this year. Uh, 
will then move into an October to April gathering our requirements. Our end goal is to be able to, by the end of this year, be ready to go out to RFP, or next year rather, uh, go out to RFP to select a, a new product or service. Um, then what the, this chart lays out is what the, the year ahead would look like where once we would have secured something uh, by end of next year, we would use 2017 to build the new system and test it in our environment uh, and, uh, and then move into staff training and implementation early in 2018. Um, we continue to work on, because we still have a few more of those peak nights ahead of us before we, we reach, um, we, we reach a, a new solution. Um, part of the solution is opening up new capacity in the West End and with Minto Recreation and Richcraft Barhaven we have added, especially in the swimming area, some new capacity, uh, although the courses have filled up very quickly and, and have waiting lists already. So even though we've invested heavily in solving the problem, the, the demand remains very high. Uh, we've, inv we've enabled in the last year uh, residents being able to do self-serve online to create their own, uh, their own accounts before they had to call in and, and get staff assistance to do that. So that streamlined and reduced the pressure on registration nights and, and leading up to registration nights. Uh, we've adjusted the start times to, to a more a reasonable hour so folks don't get to bed so late on, on those peak nights. Uh, we've staffed up on those eight nights a year, we've staffed up with uh, both IT staff, our own business support staff, so that if there are problems with either the service or residents get into very specific individual problems, we have a good team ready to respond, and that has helped immensely. And then our corporate communications folks have done an excellent job of providing advanced communication, reminding people to get their account, get their PIN numbers, uh, to prepare themselves and select their programs. And all this helps speed up uh, registration night um, registration night processes. And of course, social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook has helped immensely in getting that message out uh, to our tech savvy clients. And uh, if you have any questions. All right. Well, we can <clears throat> we can bundle the questions to the end if uh, you want to go do that way. It's, certainly, that's the will of the committee. Okay. So, who's next? Okay. Um, so, I'm here this morning to talk to you about strategic initiative number 50, which is the legacy technology system replacement. And um, funding was provided through the SI for 2017 and 2018. This presentation is going to give you an update on what we've done since the approval in July. So you may be aware that um, the system that Planning and Growth Management and Committee of Adjustment use um, for processing our applications is the MAP system, the Municipal Application Partnership System. It, um, it's the legacy system that we're wanting to replace um, for our use. It's uh, not been supported by the vendor for the last 10 years. It's rapidly approaching end of life and thankfully Charles' staff have been able to hold it together. But um, this is a really important um, piece of, um, a really important system for us to replace. So the goal of this um, SI is to implement a new technology system to replace the use of the MAP system. And that's for accepting, processing and managing planning applications, so zoning, official plans, site plan control applications, construction and related permits, encroachment permits, mobile field inspections, enforcement and committee of adjustment applications. To date, uh, we've completed um, working sessions uh, with the use of a consultant that was um, loaned to us by Service Ottawa, and we really appreciate that. We spent an intensive six weeks in the latter part of the summer working with a number of stakeholders to ensure the alignment and identifying synergies between the application processes to make the, the net result um, better. 
And um, that work has led to um, client, a client journey mapping exercise that we've, um, we've initiated with Service Ottawa. And that's, um, that's a process where we put the, the needs of the client up front and we look at the experience that they go through so that we can identify gaps in our process and, and develop efficiencies. We've also, um, with uh, the help of Information Technology Services, completed the statement of work to um, hire a project manager for this work. So the next steps for the rest of this year, we'll hire the project manager, finalize the governance structure, and that's establishing a steering committee and, and those ki kind of reporting relationships, develop the project charter and the work plan, and determine the resource requirements. And in 2016, we'll begin work on the request for proposal and begin gathering the business requirements. All right, thank you. Okay, great, go ahead. Wanna go ahead with uh, IT transformation? Yes, okay. yes, we're bundling all our questions. All right, good. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'm going to speak to you today about where we're at in uh, IT transformation. Uh, of course, <clears throat> me coming here was uh, to make sure that we do transform IT for the city. Uh, right now what we're doing is following best practices and to support the strategic priorities for the council and the operational requirements, of course, for the corporation. <clears throat> uh, we're also trying to address the growing pressures in technology today to change the landscape. And I think if we take a look at the, at the technology landscape today, never before, I think, in the history of technology, even when the introduction of PC, have we seen such a change in where technology is going. Uh, it's no longer about just the device that you have, your computer, your, your cell phone. It's about devices talking to devices now. It's about uh, uh, robotics. It's about all sorts of different technologies that we thought were fantasy maybe five, ten years ago, and they're actually being implemented today. Everything from hotels that no longer have people in them. You come to the desk and there's a, there's a robot serving you at the desk to taking your luggage to so on. There's, there's actually hotels like that in China, and uh, uh, we're moving along in those directions. We've got plants tweeting you, telling you that it needs watering. We've got plants tweeting the hoses, telling them that to turn on the water, and then the hoses checking with uh, the weather forecast to see if uh, they should turn on the water because the weather might, uh, might provide the rain. So technology is definitely changing in a way that uh, I don't think we've ever seen before. We talk a lot about the cloud, moving to the cloud. Um, I often refer to it as the fog because when you talk to, to people about the cloud, they don't... Uh, nobody has the same idea of what the cloud is. And the city faces uh, all sorts of issues as we do that. Everything from our data sovereignty, data security, uh, the, the information that we have on individuals, what do we do with that information? Are we okay to put that information in China? Uh, where do we put that kind of information? How do we handle that deal? So there's everything from not just technology, but also from our policies to look at. And so. Part of that transformation strategy has to look at everything from the business to our governance to our strategies. So, <clears throat> sorry, if you look at <clears throat> the city is committed to service excellence, and we are, we can drive efficiencies in all these departments. That's what technology should do. We'll hear of things like the Internet of Things, uh, which are some of the, the items that I just talked about, but there are many more. And we need to take uh, a lot of time to do communication and education of our partners and between us, uh, the council and, and uh, IT. We're looking at doing things, everything from lunch and learns, getting vendors in, uh, industry experts. We're putting our plans together. We've partnered with economic development because we see that as a big issue in the city. Uh, we need technology roadmaps for each of our departments. Uh, and we need to deal with our local companies. There's a lot of good local companies, uh, as the other councillor had said earlier. We have lots of technology in the city that we can deal with. So technology has changed, and we are going to uh, start our transformation with dealing with four major pillars. So the pillars are IT governance, and I'll explain uh, these pillars in the next slides. 
IT business uh, model, operational excellence, and strategic readiness. So IT governance. <clears throat> IT governance uh, really covers things like investment decisions. So we had Kitmit. We're now moving to sort of Kitmit 2.0, which is uh, much more integrated with the business and solving business issues. We're talking about investments, how we get projects through. We have lists and lists and lists of projects here we'd like to do, but we're only resourced to do so many, and so how do we make those priorities uh, with keeping, uh, getting input from the council, from the business, on what are the priorities. Uh, doing IM, IT data management, innovation engagement, enterprise roadmaps, these are the components of IT governance. And if you look at the, the basic principles that we're looking at, is we're looking at uh, basically digital first, or what I like to call is digital to the core. We have to move in a, in a digital uh, environment, and, and working with Service Ottawa helps us do that to understand what the business needs are. We have to be mobile first. The world is moving mobile. That's where we need to be. And in fact, many of our vendors don't support uh, a lot of the technology that we have today. And if we want to, the new technologies, we won't have a choice. We do have to move on because the vendors are moving on. The other principle that we're looking at is putting the city first, which when we set up our governance, instead of uh, individuals coming just to represent their departments, we want to make sure that we represent the city first, your department second, so the people on this IT committee that's what they'll be, what they'll be, or this uh, governance group will be focused with. And a lot of the IT, of course, um, subcommittee is exactly deal done, are dealing with uh, the city first. So governance is, is one of the pillars. The next pillar is uh, IT service business model. So when we talk about the business model, we're talking about implementing and better aligning skills and resources to support uh, the refreshed business model standards and process. We need new funding models uh, for technology solutions and services. So you heard of one um, from the uh, uh, Ottawa Wi-Fi. Uh, we have to look at better partnering, better funding models. Where do those things come from? And that's uh, part of the uh, service business model. <coughs> Operational excellence. So operational excellence talks about our current, uh, or we have to look at our current policies, standards, and practices, and also regarding cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is, as we move out to the cloud, cybersecurity has to be important to us. We've already seen one incident, and it was really just a shot over the bow, which was uh, the dancing banana. I think everyone uh, understands that one. Uh, to be honest with you, we, that was, we were very fortunate on that one, and, and thank goodness the person who did it was uh, half civilized. It could have been much worse than it was, but it was a shock to us to wake up that this is the world that we live in. Uh, cost containment is an operational excellence, so we have to make sure that we're not spending money foolishly, that we're containing costs, that we're reducing legacy applications, moving on to new applications. And again, we talked about security, uh, making sure that we're um, aligned that way into the new world. Strategic readiness <clears throat> is another area that we're looking at. So if you look at strategic readiness, we're, we're saying we have to make sure that our infrastructure within the city is stable to be able to move to things like the cloud computing, move to having uh, other organizations support us, whether it's private sector or other government departments. We have to look at solution lifecycle management, and we have to align our enterprise roadmap. Where are we going as a city, and where do we want to be? And in the digital world, there's many options now, and we really have to focus on making sure that we're ready for that. And the last part is being responsive. So we need to respond. It's no longer acceptable to take two or three years to develop applications. and and millions and millions of dollars. We now have to look at how do we get more responsive uh, <clears throat> by using the new technologies, the new architectures that are out there, and make sure that we have people inside that understand it. Uh, web architectures is something the city doesn't have, and those are positions that we do need, and we need to make sure that we're uh, putting uh, our strategy together for that. 
So those are the first <coughs> components. We have them broken out in a little more detail as we move along and what those components mean, but we're going to be taking the next uh, three or four months working with one of the industry leaders to make sure that it's well uh, laid out and, and uh, hope to bring that back to this committee to, so we can see the full roadmap. Thank you. All right, thank you. So on to questions, Councillor Tierney. All right, the bucket of questions. Um, so uh, first of all, with the uh, back to the program rec uh, registration facility booking payment system, um, I was reading in the report uh, where you don't want to go with a um, out of house solution. And I'm wondering, have you looked at different cities? Uh, obviously you always do. Um, Edmonton, Calgary, they seem to be using active networks. I don't know if that's in or out of house, it's hard to tell. Um, just, just want some feedback on that because it seems like we're driving for an RFP, but it, I only see one player in town on this one, so may, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe through the MISA channels there's a whole bunch of opportunities I'm missing here, but I'm curious, uh, is there other players in town on this product? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, you're right that Active Canadian is probably by far the, the Canadian and the North American product of choice. They are a product that's moving from uh, selling software licenses like we currently do to a software as a solution where they would host and process uh, the registrations and perhaps even the payments in, in, in a future world. Uh, we are right at the point now that we've stood up a steering committee to look at this and we are right at the point of uh, you know, in addition to creating the business cases and looking at all the risks, uh, at the point of identifying whether when we go out to market, whether, um, whether we take the time now to look at the market and evaluate whether there are other options, what they are, and, and, and then roll that into an RFP or whether it really is a, only one or very limited uh, options in town. There are other options. Some of our community partners have brought from New Zealand, I believe, an option that they are exploring. Um, the issue with those, as I mentioned in my presentation, is that often uh, they are not bilingual, often they are not scalable to our size of operation, we are probably one of the larger clients for this because we have so many sites with so many varied needs. Um, so we're right at the point of look at, at trying to answer the hard questions you're asking about what's out there and, and how do we reflect that in an RFP, how broad do we make it? Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could add to that as well, the, um, we've put in, in our new governance model gating and one of the gating is to look at the solutions. And of course, I said some of our principles are mobile first and digital first. Uh, we often, we always compare ourselves to other municipalities to see what they have. Uh, but we've also made a lot of mistakes about picking things that other municipalities have had because we pick something that works for them, but it's a legacy technology. And then we commit to it for the next five or six years. It costs us a fortune to maintain it and we can't move on to the new technologies. And so uh, we have to be very careful that just because some other municipality is doing it, it doesn't mean it's a, it's a good solution. And, and, and thank you, Charles, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I guess where I'm kind of stuck is, uh, it's a bit of Groundhog Day around here. We've, we've heard this for years about the issues and unfortunately we have to take the brunt of it. So I just want to be sure, and I'm still waiting for that question to be answered, maybe it's one you can bring back to us. Are Calgary and Edmonton doing theirs outside of their building? Are they allowing active networks to manage what they're doing, which avoids those bottlenecks in the crashing systems because they do have the bandwidth they can scale up instantly? Are they doing that now? Because my understanding was we never went with an external solution uh, based on privacy legislation, uh, thoughts around Patriot Act, all these things. That's why we made our decisions in the past. So I, I don't know if you can take that home uh, and, and think about that and maybe provide back to this committee next time we meet 
what what the answers are on that because again that was my understanding and forgive me I know you're you're still relatively new here but we were told it was because of privacy reasons we were doing everything in house which means those extra resources and you know two million dollars of server space if you want to eliminate those bottlenecks and get the licensing well if somebody else can do it better and faster I'm kind of perplexed why we're not doing that. Well, well, that is part of this plan, is to first we have to figure out what the business requirements are, and then we have to go out and look at who does that. And so no one is saying we're going to do it internally. In fact, uh, when you talk about digital first and mobile first, it often means going outside to get it done. So I don't know if this would be direction to staff or or... Or if, if you could look into it and even get back to me directly, I'm Absolutely. fine with that. Yep. Uh, I, I think actually if you can circulate it to members of the committee, I'm seeing a lot of nodding heads. Uh, I think it is of interest to us because we have to go through this twice a year. And I feel for Dan uh, and his shop uh, where, where we're not servicing the public uh, because of uh, financial limitations or technology limitations. Um, I had a couple other questions related to, I don't know if it's SI-53 or SI-50, but I'll just cut right to it. Um, when it comes to our operating systems, I, I haven't heard too much talk about the operational side of things and what we deal with and the tools we use with our you know, 15, 16,000 employees. Um, I'm looking at our, our operating system. We're using Windows 7. Um, it's, support, it's standard mainstream support is going to evaporate in 2015. We're going to be paying for extended. You look at Office 2007, its mainstream support ended in 2012. We're paying for extended support to 2017, and then they're saying that's it. Uh, you look at, uh, and I think one of the bigger issues is uh, Internet Explorer. Uh, it's no secret, Microsoft is saying, sorry, that doesn't exist anymore. We never made that product, and we're moving to Edge. That's where they're headed. And if you look on their website, they make it very clear. January 12, 2016, that's it. They're not supporting any other flavors of browser. It's Edge. So have we developed a plan around that because we're sitting here essentially two and a half, three months away from January where we won't even be able to start up our built-in browser? And the second question to that is, obviously, these extended support costs impact us. Have we done an analysis, and it has to be kind of timely because their life cycle is only six-year windows, have we looked to see what those costs are that we're incurring with the extended life support? So a lot of questions there. Some of those I may have to come back with. Absolutely, uh, by the way. I, I, I completely understand I'm kind of throwing it all out there because this committee needs a little less. you know, you're probably better off coming back with it to committee um, at the next meeting. Yeah. Because uh, I think everyone's going to want a more comprehensive look at it. When's the next meeting? So if that's the case, uh, I, I think, I think the, the, the concern is, and maybe you have a quick answer, yes, is... We, we have a budget meeting December 4th, so we could incorporate it. It's, it's before the January 16th elimination of Internet Explorer. So, so this is part of the transformation plan. We have a lot of legacy systems. You're not telling me anything new here. <clears throat> we have a lot of legacy systems, and... I, I don't think he said it was new. I think he said it's been there way too long. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I'm saying that, that the problem isn't new. I, it, it isn't something you're telling me that I don't know. I know that this problem is here, and that's part of our transformation plan is to deal with those issues. As far as the support and maintenance and those sorts of things, we'll figure our way through that. We always will until we get to the next level, but we do have to get to the next level. There's absolutely right. Microsoft is moving to the cloud <clears throat> with their 365. We have to look at doing uh, similar things to move. And, uh, you know, I, uh, just... I want people to make sure that it's not as, as easy as just saying we're going to upgrade. We have many of our systems, legacy systems in this uh, city tied into our email. So the moment you cut and say you're going to, to upgrade our email or do something, you're going to shut down about 20 or 30 other systems. So it is in the plan to transform, and it's not going to be something that we do overnight, and we do have to deal with the, the issues of ongoing maintenance until we get there. Yeah, absolutely, and, and I completely appreciate that. I understand when there's major change in software products. Training is also another aspect. I fully appreciate all of that. I'm just saying the runway is getting very short yep. on the life cycle. We're, we're using Office 2007. I mean, Office 2007, they, mainstream support evaporated in 2012. So we must be paying a massive 
fee for those uh, extended support life cycles through Microsoft. And I want to know, as a committee member, how much we're spending and what's the plan. Because when it came to the operating system upgrade we did for, uh, up to uh, Windows 7 that we're on uh, now from XP, there was a plan. And we, this committee, held the feet to the fire to make sure what percentage it was, how far we were getting along, and when we got to the final 15 percent before they discontinued support and they were shutting off XP forever, we knew the reasons and the rationale for that. I don't see any of that for our operating system, for our office tools, for our browser. And I want to see that. Yeah, my pleasure. I'll bring that back at our next, uh, our next meeting. Okay, so next meeting is December 4th which will be the budget meeting, so we'll do them both at the same time. Truck diet, not software diet. Yeah. Okay, uh, Councillor Drews. I just want to thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I just want to uh, echo what uh, Tim's saying. And I, I know, Charles, you know, we had this discussion before. Uh, we c uh, I think in the Canadian industry, we're very conservative in our technology. And the fear here is we understand and we see all the cyber attacks and what's happening. And the implementation at the city, because we're humongous, it's always technology by the time we implement and by the time we think we reach into technology, we are behind the technology. So the innovation and what we're looking at, best practices, I have to agree with you. We cannot look at different municipality. Maybe we need to look step, step further because and sometimes you need to take a uh, different approach, especially in IT. Uh, environment. So uh, we really, before we move to any technology, first of all, we need to, m to make sure the implementation is fast. Second of all, we need to make sure also the, the, all co the compatib compatibility is over always there because everything has to be compatible. But our issues right now, what we're facing in the city, if I am, from what I understand and reading in the report, as much as you know, it's the compatibility is not there. We need to make sure all the technology moving forward will be able to, uh, uh, to, be, to be able to manage and mix them all together and be able to be uh, user friendly. So I just want to make sure that I put this out because I know you and I had this conversation before and we're really, if it's going to take us longer to look what we need to move, it's better to look to making sure that this is the right technology and the right direction. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Reaper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a few questions related to the uh, items that were brought out in the presentations. I do want to come back to the registration um, uh, system for a moment. Uh, what will be the improvement that we can expect as a result of the, uh, the new, uh, whatever new software we're putting in place? Mr. Chair, of course, what we can talk about right now, because we, we don't know what ultimate product we will end up with, but um, certainly what, what I outlined in, in, in the presentation, one of the key things that we need to address is scalability, the ability to take those first nights of registration, those peaks, and be able to handle those volumes. And so the capacity to do that is, uh, you know, absolutely critical in our mind. Uh, but then, of course, we will be looking at other things that are top of mind and, and priorities. Some of them we already have, but we want to improve on. Certainly the ability um, to generate management reports that help feed the business and understand the business is, is critical from a management perspective. Uh, a system that is um, fully bilingual, that, that is, um, um, you know, that isn't a lot of extra work to maintain because it is, those kinds of things. Um, and so a system that will allow, because of the high number of programs that we put into these systems, and then when we make a change, whether it's a council-directed change or it's something that happens through budget, um, 
the ability to quickly move that information through the system and reflect it in all of those programs, whether it's an increase or it's a change in, in, in how we process a transaction. So, and then of course the, the, the innovation of social media and, and, and uh, portable devices uh, so that we catch up to, to some of that reality. Uh, those are kind of the, some of the big things that we're looking for. But in terms of a, a time improvement for residents, how long it takes them to register their child for swimming lessons on those peak evenings, uh, are we aiming for some kind of an improvement there? Well, we, we are certainly, um, and, and the RFP isn't written yet, but in my mind we would certainly be saying our peak is five, at least 5,000 people trying to come in the door at the same time. And so that's where we would start um, so that it, the registration night experience is pretty comparable to any other night of the week uh, the, the type of thing. So, so that would be the ultimate. Um, now whether we can achieve that with a product that's on the market now it remains to be seen. But that would be our expectation is to go for, we understand what our, our volume of business is and we'd be looking for something that can scale up to that. And we think because um, it's not economical to do it for eight nights a week, but it probably is economical if that infrastructure supports other things and, and is able to um, you know, be put, put to use at other times, that that is achievable. So we, we need the right circumstances to have that scalability, and that's what we'd be looking for. I think our, our residents are going to be uh, disappointed in us if we don't sort of achieve a, a significant improvement over the, the two-hour uh, registration time that it takes to, to register. Absolutely. That is a mission-critical piece to that. Now, of course, the reality is that they will, may get the answer that the program they're looking for is full a lot quicker because at the end of the day, the ability to increase capacity for service on the front lines is, is limited by the number of facilities that we have to, to and, and the, the time that we have available. But they won't be waiting online for two hours to find out and exactly. they can move on to their second best choice, their third best choice, those kinds of things. By the time, um, uh, you know, I find out pretty quickly that uh, general admission for a Springsteen concert is sold out within a couple of minutes and I know right away, so uh, reduces my frustration. Um, MAP, uh, the, uh, the program to replace MAP. I'm just wondering, I mean, we hear a lot, uh, and since I've gotten here, there are dozens of platforms that we um, uh, have that are legacy, that are falling apart, we desperately need to replace. How much time and money are we spending currently? And I, I think it's um, important to, to relay this to the public, maintaining MAP the way it is. Uh, I can't answer that question, but I can get back to you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, with that answer if you want. Okay. Yeah, I think just as we go into budget discussions, it's going to be important to have a clear story to tell residents to talk about with uh, with our colleagues in terms of the need to invest in here. So and we can, we can the, add that uh, to December 4th as well. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, IT transformation. Um, can you give me some insight? I'm, I'm hearing about, you know, sort of interdepartmental cooperation um, the, on the IT transformation side. Who at the staff level is involved in discussions? Who's making decisions um, about, you know, what to present to council, what direction to take? What are the mechanisms at maybe a more granular level, uh, the behind-the-scenes work that we're not seeing and that the public is not seeing? Sure. Um, Mr. Chair, we, we've, when I came in, we, we had a, a group set up. Uh, called Kitmet, and it um, it had a couple of focuses. It had a business focus, a technology focus, and uh, to align with best practices, we really want to have that group is to have a business focus, uh, so that they can understand what we what the requirements are for the business, and um, make the decisions at that level. So what I've asked for is the, the heads of all the departments to send their they're either their second in command or someone who influences the organization so they can have these business discussions, so they can have these conversations around the table. Uh, today we've demonstrated a little bit of that by having the departments talk about their technology solutions rather than IT coming in yeah. 
and giving you the nuts and bolts of what's going on behind the scenes, what business problems are we solving for the city. And so that committee, uh, we are going to kick it off next Tuesday uh, is, the, is the first kickoff day. And uh, we're, we're right in talks now as to uh, where that committee is going to report to within the organization. Uh, and I can get back to you on that. And that is uh, how we're also going to get uh, uh, the IT subcommittee involved in the decisions and show what's on the table and make sure we've got your input coming into the table. So now we'll take again the principles of city first. What are the things that we need to do to the city? What are the things that we're more business aligned for? The business will be concerned about what it is that we're to do for the city. And the technology group will be, uh, IT will be focused on how we're going to do it. And sometimes in the past what we've had are people coming and saying, I've seen this new shiny thing and I think I really need one of those. And we have implemented that way and only to find out that it really didn't solve the business requirement and then we were stuck with another technology that we had to support. So we're going to take a, a, a more cooperative approach between the two and I see that as we go forward as the technology changes so quickly as we're moving out to the internet, the internet of things, uh, businesses need the help to understand what's the realm of possibility and then they can go out and look at solutions to have and we can uh, uh, implement that technology. So I, I applaud you for that, uh, for that approach and I applaud you for the approach that you've taken this afternoon. This has actually been very helpful, um, I think, for the, the whole committee to understand the, uh, the work that you're doing. As we move forward, um, you know, I'm sure that we'll probably get into uh, a more granular level of information even with regular reporting, which segues actually quite nicely. I, I do want to put a motion on the uh, table. I think it's no, uh, we'll seconded. We'll hold off on that. We'll hold off on that? Okay, just with respect to um, uh, more frequent reporting. I do have one more question, Mr. Yep. Chair, if I can beg you indulgence. Um, with respect to staffing, um, I, I, we're holding software together. Uh, we are keeping uh, servers uh, on, uh, on life support that need replacement. Those obviously are not the best use of, of our staff's time. It's not where we want staff to be looking. Uh, we want staff who are able to build the apps that come out of the business case decisions that uh, your committee is going to be making with the help of, uh, of IT subcommittee. Uh, we want uh, the, the, the network architects um, that you've referred to uh, earlier in your discussion. How well placed are we with our staff to transform from people who are keeping lights on and applying bubble gum to uh, antiquated software to that nimble, responsive, uh, forward-looking organization? Okay, no. Mr. Chair, uh, it's a good question. Uh, we do have a lot of legacy. We do have people taking care of legacy applications. And we need to, to move to that sort of cloud. <clears throat> How do you build those kind of applications? The people that we have uh, are very well trained in computer science, computer engineering. They have four to <clears throat> six years, seven years of that kind of training in technology. And it's uh, relatively easy for them to make that transition. We do need to invest in their training. We need, need to make sure that uh, they have time to train and learn, learn the new technologies. But more importantly, we need to alleviate them from the old technologies that they're forced to support. So we need to look at the legacy technologies and to uh, eliminate as many of those as we can so that we can move on with the new. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's going to be critical. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, quick question to Councillor Tierney and then we'll get back to Mark. Oh, uh, Mary and then, sorry. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, just building on that one first, uh, the, uh, who can make the decision to say you can't have that legacy anymore, you have to change it? Is it the department or you or is there some other way? Because one of the problems you just say is the shiny new things. We had that happen in OC Transport caused us all sorts of grief. The, um, uh, and then there is a tendency for people to see something happening well, whether it's how they do their in Edmonton and Calgary, which is even mentioned by a member of the committee here. It's not necessarily the best, it might be. So is there, is there some, was this committee going to create that way of approval or does it have to get up to the city manager? Who, how is it going to happen? We're going through that planning process right now as to who's going to make those decisions and we're, I don't know, Steve, if you wanted to speak to that one. Uh, Councillor, previously the, uh, the KitBit group was making recommendations formulating the IT roadmap. That was uh, considered and 
uh, ultimately directed by the senior management and the executive committee. So I know Charles is working on a revised governance structure that he's discussing with the city manager. I am I'm assuming at some point that, uh, uh, you know, notwithstanding this transition to this uh, new, new, new uh, role for the KITMIT or CBIT, that the senior management and executive would still be involved in oversight of the uh, IT roadmap. And if the committee... Uh, okay. So as that new governance structure is put together, I guess we'll get a report on that later on. Okay, good. I think it's necessary. I think there's been a little bit... We still have the silos. And th that committee could actually say to somebody then, this legacy one is not going... is not some fit in anymore. You're changing it. And if the department says, no, you can't change that, that, that can be overruled. Right, and that is the principle that we're putting forward, city first. And one of them will be if we have a choice between maintaining a legacy or moving on to something new, we'll move on to something new. And these are the principles that we're trying to get established now. Okay. And in the policy of doing this, we have had apps done by the city and apps done by outside people using our open data system and things like this. So they're going to be, and you talked about using more private business and everything else, which I agree with. We've got lots of technology help in this city um, and elsewhere. Uh, is that going to be part of the whole policy framework and, man and governance system that you bring in of how, they, how we connect with business as opposed to doing it on an ad hoc basis, which what happens now? Right. Right now, again, I'm also going through the organizational changes and trying to get those approved as well. One of the uh, uh, areas that I'm proposing is an innovation group to deal with uh, exactly those issues, working with the industry, looking at what's out there, and it'll always be a combination of city employees doing applications as well as uh, external businesses. We've, we've moved a lot to um, partnering with businesses, but there'll always be that combination between city staff and, and moving outward. I don't have any problem with that, but I have a problem with always city staff and they don't look at the outside people, which has tended to be the, the case. Right. And a big part is, is integration, too, which our staff will be looking at. As we bring in other applications, we want to make sure that, um, that for example, we don't have, uh, you know, 150 billing systems. So, because each application on the web would have their own and we would want to say, no, we, we have one, two, or three here in the city. and and we would make sure that we integrate those into our technologies, and I think that was to the other councillors. And these are important ways of saving funds in the end for other Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and the recreation things, um, all the information you get from the, from the mass chaos of, of the built bookings, are you taking that to come up with things that you could change where you do the various program? Because when I find out that people say that within 10 minutes, every preschool program in the Richcraft Centre is gone and they're having to go to Orleans or something. That's starting to happen. And do you then modify your programs? And because the two should be integrated together, not just the registration, but how you then change your programs because the registration tells you the need is there. Chair, um, yes. Uh, the, the current system does have its limitations in terms of how quickly it can give us that kind of information, although uh, when we do end up on, on the peak registration nights with classes that have waiting lists, then our staff are very quick the next day to add classes and call the people on those waiting lists to do that if that's poss physically possible within the building um, because a lot of this is often pool-based programming. Um, it helps to have eight lanes. Uh, at, at, I want my eight hundred fifty thousand dollars back. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what I. That's what I raised for those extra two lanes. And so the staff will look at adding at either at that site or at a nearby site um, some of the some of what we collect out of out of a. Um, waiting list, but that's usually a day later when we've had a chance to, to, I know to they do, do an it, analysis there's, there's of it. Some, there's some limitation. I've also been told by people, I don't know how we get around this one, when the, when the pool and the Goulburn pool was closed and they all went to Richcraft, a lot of them are not going back because they like the Richcraft facility better, which puts an extra pressure on that facility. Do you have in your, your when you're your bookings and things, can you see the relative impact the things and this is swim clubs and things too which take quite a lot of time is, is that can you pick that up from your booking system or does that have to be done by kind of manually 
Um, we are able to track some of that through, through postal codes, and it is kind of an observable factor that when we have an extended shutdown at a location and people migrate to a different location, that some of them stay. They end up liking their, their new home uh, and, and, and don't often go back. And that is often the challenge of building a new clientele at the, at the newly opened facility or trying to attract them back. But you're quite right that for the closure of Goulburn, as people scattered out and, and a lot of them went to Richcraft, um, it's a pretty impressive alternative to certainly to what Goulburn was now that it's, 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 it's been rehabilitated, it's much better, but, um, nice. but people change their patterns and then stick with them. And I think that's been observable for um, not just for pools, but for other types of facilities. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look, I, I must say, I know that it's still bad at registration. But it's better than it was five years ago. The new councillors don't know how bad it used to be. <laughs> it was much, much worse. So any improvement in there is going to be very much wanted. The other thing is on the planning. Um, is this new system going to get rid of all those paper copies of plans? I mean, there's a huge cost involved for, build, for people doing them, having to redo 65, 85 copies of plans again and again, circulating. It takes a lot of time. And the, the, the builders tell me, we, do, we prepare these online, so why can't we circulate them online? Um, Chair, that's exactly what we hope this new system will do. Um, right now, for planning applications, the applicant has to bring in 55 copies of every plan and every report that goes along with the application. And that's just for circulation purposes. And, and if there's one change, staff. they've got to redo them, because I remember doing them three times for one I did before. Yeah. Exactly. So um, the new system will, that would be my primary objective, would be for the system to not have so much paper. And that includes the Committee of Adjustment ones. Well, we'll be able to, like right now, it's hard for us. We get the notice of it, the one pager. To actually get the reports and the background stuff, you have to pull teeth. And is it going to be something that is online that I can, or a member of the public, can then just go and say this application, click here, and it's just like the dev apps things, all the reports are there. That's exactly what we hope it will do. And so this will all be integrated into the whole system because you're doing a citywide operation and not an individual planning one. You're going, are you, did you exactly. go on the magic wand, Charles? <laughs> As I say, it's a transformation plan, so, so it will take time, but that's exactly where we've got to start today. We've talked a little bit about history, but I've got to start where we are today, and moving forward, we've got to take these approaches. So you really have to start from scratch and build a new system. Yeah, absolutely. And this would be probably a cloud system then? Yes. Well, there'll be, and, and it depends on what your definition of a cloud is, but it will definitely be those sorts of uh, digital first, mobile first. So. Uh, we don't, we're not looking to have a lot of paper, we're, and we're looking that you should be able to point to somebody and say, here's the information, go get it. And the, and the key people who have to make a change can make that change securely so nobody else can change it but doesn't have the authority to without having to redo everything. Exactly. And those are, so, so again, that's the, the mantra that, that we're going forward with to get modernized. And it's going to take a couple of years, I guess, to get that going. That'll take a while to get going. But all new projects that are coming through now, and you see class and um, uh, the legacy application, those are going through the new process now to be exactly that way. So those are the first two new ones that are coming through. Okay, good. And all other ones that are follow will be doing the same thing. And the old ones will be pushed off. You either get a system that works within the system or you do it a different way. We're hoping to come back here with a list of applications that we believe that should be end of life so that we can move on. I think, I think we, we, we don't hear enough about what all the problems are. I know I had a very good meeting with you and with Donna that I was really impressed with the process that you're going through and, uh, and that everything is being integrated, which is so critical. Right. And so we will be getting regular reports on that then. I think there's a motion to that. I yeah. would support that. Thanks. Yeah, the motion is a little further. Okay, thank you to Councillor Turney. He had a, uh, a part of his question he forgot to ask. Yeah, I got too fired up in the first part. Um, so I'll make this a, a quick question. Uh, pet registration systems and the pet licensing uh, elements. I know we did a great job on the ICE portion of it and towards the end of the last um, 
last term of council, there was a big push on the pet registration component and it kind of got left in the wayside because I know there were some technology changes. Are we still ever going to move ahead on that? Is that something we're going to do? Mr. Chair, yes, the pet registration was a piece that we've kept in the Service Ottawa program um, being managed out of my group with ITS and we're planning completion of that pet registration, uh, completion of the product I think by the end of this year and implementation into early next year. And, th and that's great news because the Mayor's always asking for revenue generators and I see this as a good possibility for one so thank you for your hard work on that. It's too bad the media weren't here to hear that so. <laughs> Anyway, okay, um, I have a couple of questions. In the previous terms, uh, term of council, 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 or sorry, committee was formed, uh, commitment uh, to assess, approve, reject uh, proposals and initiatives and to implement them. And in uh, Ms. Gray's report, uh, she refers to the Web Governance Committee. Is that separate from the, from the, uh, business slash IT implementation group or is it the same body? Mr. Chair, the Web Governance Committee has kind of a multiple mandate. One is it looks at to make sure that all of the compliance of policy and legislation that we have on the website as people put um, content and applications onto that website, we want to make sure it meets our accessibility criteria, our language and our bi uh, bilingualism, privacy. So we've been working with all of those statutory groups to develop a compliance program. So part of that is establishing that and really looking at how do we control that and manage that and make sure that our departments and our content are complying with that. As well, there is a piece which the digital strategy will, will feed into as well around what are those priority directions that we think from a web perspective we want to do. The new look and feel, the new uh, functionality that we want to be able to create on the web, the web priorities of content that departments will bring forward, which may just be publishing. If any of those have a direct technology, not all of them do, some of them are just things that we can do with existing resources within in Service Ottawa, if they have a technology or a build component, they're an input to uh, the governance process that Charles is speaking to in terms of setting those priorities. And they'll have to balance priorities that will be compliance and legislative priorities on the web, as well as customer service and operational efficiencies as well. And that's the intent of that governance committee. Okay, so they're separate. They are separate, okay. but, but, but they connected. work together. Okay. Okay, so on the other one, on the, the governance one, um, when when did it first meet? Tuesday. Tuesday. This Tuesday is our is our first meeting. Okay. Chair, if I could, so the they are separate, but they both the recommendations coming out of the Web Governance Committee will feed into the IT roadmap developed by Kitmet, and that will be elevated to the or escalated to the senior to the executive committee for ultimate consideration and approval. So, so Kitmet continues then. Okay. So you have three committees? So let me, if we have the IT governance committee, there are certain rules and regulations that you have to comply with if you put out an application. So for example, the web. We have a common look and feel that you have to have in the web. You have accessibility. So as we go through developing a product and going through this governance committee, one of the gates before you can get through is have you complied with uh, Donna's group with that common look and feel. So we are very well integrated because it's it's part of you can't get past it. It's there in the in the group. But Donna has other activities that she has to take care of as well on top of that. Okay. Does that make sense? It might. Are there so there are three committees then? Are there two or are there three? The executive committee is uh, well, not executive committee. Yeah, so that's the that's the third committee that I'm okay. referring to, though. Okay. Yeah, that the, the information from, as Charles is saying, the skating system information feeds from uh, the web governance committee. Uh, Kitmits dealing with information that's consolidated and ultimately is escalated to the executive with respect to approval of the of the plan, the the, the IT roadmap or plan. So the cross silos committee is basically which. Sorry, the which committee? The one dealing cross silos. Is the IT governance committee. Okay. So, and 
and Donna's uh, requirements will be part of that committee. So okay. the only the committee that you have to look at for projects being approved and where we're going is that uh, it's, it's, it's a business IT governments, governance committee, which is that the KITMET, and it will report up to executive committee. All right, can you, since these are official committees, that means they have terms of reference, can you send them to the committee, to our committee? Yes, yeah, so the first meeting is, is again on Tuesday is the kickoff. It's to finalize our terms of reference. It's to finalize to make sure that we we have an understanding and buy-in, and uh, we can definitely send that to the committee. That's, uh, that was our intention to do so anyway. Okay. And how many? How often will it meet? Monthly. Okay. Um, okay. I'm just looking at this at the report here. So, how many initiatives have already been approved or rejected? Through this new committee? Right. None. We haven't met yet. So okay. Tuesday will be the first meeting. Okay. So nothing committee has proposed yet has been rejected yet. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. In the governance report um, at uh, council, uh, we have the section that says many members suggested, many members of council suggested the primary reason the subcommittee was not as effective as it wanted to be was that they received information about specific corporate technology initiatives only after they had already been approved by staff. Members were not presented with the projects that were rejected by management. Um, so this is something that's supposed to be addressed according to the resolutions of council. Uh, passed a governance review. That means we need to comply with it and it's no longer an option. It stopped being an option the day council approved it. Um, so in that, the reason council approved that is that it's important that we know uh, the state of each of our objectives, the state of our compliance requirements, and it's important that we know then how resources, including money and FTEs, are allocated. Uh, so that isn't here yet for us. I think that uh, Councilor Looper's motion will uh, help uh, flesh that out a bit. So I think now is a good time to present it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I do wish to bring a motion to the uh, table. This has been uh, extremely helpful in terms of a chance to have a, uh, a rich discussion with our staff around uh, the items that we identified in the governance review and the items that were identified in the strategic initiatives. Um, I'd like to formalize uh, the process essentially uh, to uh, for frequent reporting and, and the opportunity to have these discussions, institutionalize it, if you will, within the, um, uh, the committee's agenda. Um, so I'm going to move, and I believe uh, Councillor Tierney has uh, agreed to uh, second this motion, that the Director of Corporate Programs and Business Services, um, I'm sorry, I think I'm missing uh, wording, and the Chief Information Officer develop a protocol to supplement the balance scorecard reporting with regular updates to the information technology subcommittee on the progress of the initiatives under the mandate of the subcommittee identified in the governance review and term of council priorities for consideration and approval by the subcommittee essentially come back to us um, with a, um, a proposal for reporting back to us more frequently we'll take a look at that proposal and uh, and approve it uh, and then once we have that then we'll have that sort of regular reporting back to the committee with this kind of um, uh, broad overview and an opportunity for a rich discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, and it's important to know too that uh, um, as we, we dealt with in the Land Development Corporation, sometimes what staff rejects is just as significant as what it moves forward with and uh, we are responsible for that even if you do it, right? So we, uh, we need to know this. So uh, is there any uh, debate on the motion? It's carried. carried? It's carried. Well, that was fun. Okay, so December 4th, we have a few things. We'll do budget as the last item on December 4th, okay? Because a couple of them, at least in theory, will, uh, will dovetail into the budget. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, 
next meeting we've already kind of established it's December 4th if everyone agrees Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay and on adjournment carried. carried it's moved by Councillor Tierney Yes, and that's, uh, uh, oh, we, oh, sorry, we did approve the issue, right? We'll do it now on items two and three combined. Carried. Received. 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 Received.